welcome to the RCO's A to Z of the organ. Today's letter is V for voluntary. Today we tend to use the word voluntary to describe a piece of music, usually a piece of organ music, that's played before or after a church service. But it's a term that has its roots in a period of great musical, liturgical and doctrinal upheaval in the English church. And it's also a term that was used to describe music that could fit a variety of purposes. Organ music written for the English Roman Catholic Church was heavily based on the plain song that was sung as part of the Latin rite. And it was often written to be played in alternatum with verses of sung chant. So in other words, the organ music actually replaced verses of sung chant. However, with the accession of Elizabeth I in 1558, uh, the Latin rite was again prohibited, as it had been during the brief reign of her half-brother Edward VI some years earlier. Composers now had to come up with new ways of writing music to serve the new liturgical forms. And obviously, as plain song was no longer used, or certainly no longer used publicly, new ideas were needed. It's around this time that we see the first use of the word voluntary as the title of a piece, a work by Richard Allwood found in the Mulliner book, a group of pieces most likely compiled in the early years of Elizabeth's reign, so in the late 1550s or perhaps early 1560s. Of course, it's difficult to know the precise dates of composition of the works found in the Mulliner book. Uh, although many of them are based on plain songs, so those at least were probably written before the Reformation. But in any case, the term voluntary around this time came to describe a new form of organ music. English composers may have turned to their continental colleagues around this time for inspiration for their new musical forms. After all, the monarch who reigned between Edward VI and Elizabeth I was Queen Mary, a staunch Roman Catholic who was married to Philip II of Spain, and so she had many fine Spanish musicians at her court. It's interesting to note similarities of written ornamentation and ornament symbols between English and Spanish music from around this time. And a few works of Svelink are featured in the collection of pieces known now as the Fitzwilliam Virginal Book. But whatever their sources of inspiration, composers like William Byrd and his contemporaries, and then later Orlando Gibbons, Thomas Morley and their contemporaries, all of these composers were writing music that could serve a variety of liturgical uses and that were not based on plain song. Voluntaries could bookend services the way they do today, or they could precede a psalm, a reading, or an anthem, or they could be played as incidental music at communion. So what were the musical characteristics of an Elizabethan voluntary? In his 1597 treatise entitled a plain and easy introduction to practical music, Thomas Morley described the fantasy as a piece in which a musician taketh a point at his pleasure and resteth and turneth it as he list. And lest you think I've forgotten that we're talking about V for voluntary and not F for fantasy, I haven't. The terms fancy, fantasy, verse, voluntary, all of these were pretty much interchangeable around this time. Let's look briefly at an example by William Byrd. Here we have the fancy in D minor, which begins with writing that's almost choral, slow and sustained. Byrd takes this point, as Thomas Morley would describe it, and treats it imitatively. You can see here and here the change to a new idea also to be treated imitatively. You'll notice that as the piece progresses, Momentum is increased as the note values get shorter and shorter until the writing becomes increasingly that of a virtuoso keyboard toccata. So we've touched on the variety of ways that voluntaries could be used liturgically, but voluntaries could also serve as domestic entertainment. Pieces entitled voluntary crop up in collections of music that were meant to be enjoyed in the home, perhaps played on a set of virginals or maybe a chamber organ. So their versatility extends outside the confines of the liturgy. Of course, with the rise of Puritanism culminating in the period of the Commonwealth from 1649 to 1660, 
organ music in England was largely suppressed and many organs were destroyed. However, the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 and the return of Charles II to England saw a big surge in demand for new music to enhance the liturgy and also a rise in demand for new organs to replace those that had been destroyed. It's here that we start to see continental influence again. Organs were now being built with mutations and with reeds, for example, as organ builders who had fled to the continent during the Commonwealth era returned with new ideas. Composers like Frescobaldi and Froberger, uh, and also the French music that Charles II brought back with him from his period in exile, all of these things provided sources of inspiration to English composers. We see French ornamentation in the works of composers like Henry Purcell, for example, and voluntaries written for specific registrations, such as the trumpet or the cornet. Moving into the 18th century, voluntaries tended to be multi-movement works, often beginning with a slow movement before moving into a faster, more virtuosic concerto-like movement. This culminated in the works of composers like John Stanley, who died in 1786, Stanley sometimes wrote voluntaries of even more than two movements, and he generally called for specific registrations to be used. Not everyone was a fan of the 18th century late Baroque voluntary, though, with critics saying that they were too flippant, too secular, and too showy for liturgical use. The word voluntary, used as a title or to describe an actual musical form, eventually fell into disuse in the first half of the 19th century. And as that century progressed, the term began to be used in the way in which we use it today. Thank you for joining me and do look out for the next video in the A to Z series, The Letter W.